Praise the Lord. Please, once more, let's welcome Dr. Mensah Otabel. Amen. Please don't let us forget Wednesday, Wednesday service. Bishop Owens will be here. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. As always, it's an honor to be here at Jesus' house. Well, the theme for this year is very interesting, accessing greatness. And uh, last year, I spoke about Christ in us, the hope of glory. I talked about the grace of, Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the fundamental basis for greatness for the believer. It's not what we do, but who is in us. Because greatness starts from within and grows out of us. If you're not great within, you cannot be great outside. And um, if you were not here last year, just want to encourage you, get those messages. But today, tomorrow, and Tuesday, I'm going to teach on something very practical to help you to access greatness. And so I'm going to speak on wisdom. Wisdom. Uh, if there is any subject that I think I have uh, focused on through my life and ministry is a subject of wisdom. Wisdom is critical to everything that you do. Wisdom helps you to make the right choices. Wisdom helps you to analyze issues properly. Wisdom helps you to determine what is the right way and the wrong way. Wisdom helps you to see the future and to anticipate how the future is going to be. So I, I just want to encourage you to open your heart to this message because it's going to expand and give you the tools to manage your life more effectively. And in this series, I will make a lot of references uh, to the book, the wisdom books of the Bible, that is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and to an extent, the book of Psalms. The book of Proverbs in the Bible is not a theological book. It's a practical book. It's a collection of the wisdom of Israel as they operated under the covenant of God. When God spoke to Israel, uh, he gave them laws. He, he, he would say, for example, thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not lie. That was his command. But he didn't tell them why they shouldn't steal and why they shouldn't lie. Adultery. He left that to their observance. So as they lived under the covenant of God, they observed the consequences of the word of God in their practical life. And as they observed those consequences, they wrote down the wisdom derived from obeying or disobeying the word of God. So the book of Proverbs uh, is, is almost like the practical application of the word of God to our lives and how it works out. The book of Ecclesiastes is, talks about man's effort to gain wisdom without God and the consequences of it. And the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon is saying, all of that is vanity. That is man seeking to live his life with the highest ideals without God. He says it's a waste of time and a vexation of the spirit. And a lot of people are in that mode. The book of Proverbs uh, as I said, it's not theological, so when you're dealing with that book of Proverbs, you have to be very careful how you analyze it because sometimes it says contradictory things because wisdom is very, very situational. Wisdom is based on the situation you are in. For example, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 and 5 says, uh, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. That's verse 4. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So, one, one verse says, don't do it. The other verse says, 
do it. So what does that tell you? There is a time to answer a fool and there is a time not to answer a fool. The context will determine whether to answer the fool or leave the fool to be foolish. Are you following me? So when you, when you quote from Proverbs, it, it's not like quoting a, a direct word of God. It's a, it's a practical a book and it has different applications and you have to be careful. You can teach doctrine from Proverbs, but you can teach practical wisdom from the book of Proverbs. So I'm going to start with three readings. First from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, 19, and 20, and then Psalm 104, verse 24, and Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, it says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. Note the phrase, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. Then Psalm 104 verse 4, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Note the phrase, in wisdom you have made them all. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 3. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day alters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. If you put these three verses together, there are two important concepts that come up. Number one, is that wisdom is the foundational law of God's universe. Wisdom is the foundational law of God's universe. So when you observe everything God has created, the underlying principle is wisdom. Because by wisdom, he founded the universe. There is a system of wisdom that operates in nature. When you observe the planets and how they function, when you observe life on earth, when you observe living things, non-living things, mountains, the oceans, plants, animals, the cells of the human body, there is a certain orderliness about it and it is manifestation of God's wisdom. Wisdom is the foundational law of God's universe. If you want to understand the universe, you have to do it with wisdom. Second, wisdom is the language of God's universe. The earth, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. When you observe all that God has created, the one word you hear is wisdom. Wisdom. So with that in mind, go with me to Proverbs chapter 4 verses 5 to 9. Proverbs 4, 5 to 9 says, get wisdom. Get understanding. That's a command. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. In all your getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring honor to you when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Powerful things said about one virtue, wisdom. In all your getting, get understanding. Now, if you look at this passage, you would notice that wisdom is referred in feminine terms. She and her. Now, that is not to mean that women have wisdom and men don't. Although sometimes it so appears. But that's not what the passage is saying. Wisdom is presented as a woman. Get her. Now, why is wisdom presented as a woman? Because the, the image here is that 
you pursue a, a wisdom as a man pursues a woman. Now, if you know how a man pursues a woman, he will borrow to impress a woman. Some even change the way they walk and limp on one foot just to impress a woman. They would uh, go all the lengths, you know, climb a wall, fight dogs, fight lions to pursue a woman. And, and so the Bible says that the way a man would desperately pursue a woman he loves is the way you must pursue wisdom. There should be no excuses in your pursuit of wisdom. You must climb mountains, you must climb walls, you must resist and defy people who put blockages before you and you must passionately pursue her. Get wisdom, love wisdom, exalt wisdom. Don't forget her and don't forsake her. So there has to be a certain desperation with which we seek for wisdom. We, we have to consciously, intelligently, deliberately pursue wisdom. It has to be something we do with all our lives. Wisdom has different dimensions. It has different dimensions. I'm going to talk about five dimensions of wisdom. The first dimension of wisdom is spiritual. It is called the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. Psalm 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. That means it is the gateway to wisdom. But if you have the fear of the Lord but don't pursue wisdom, it's almost like you enter the gateway but you didn't enter the house. The fear of the Lord doesn't by itself make you wise. But the fear of the Lord will give you access to wisdom. It is the gateway to wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord has two sides. One side is to hate evil. And the other side is to have a deep reverence for God. A deep reverence. When the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it doesn't talk about running away from God. It talks about having a deep sense for his laws and principles. The same way an electrician has the fear of electricity. How many of you have been shocked by electricity before? You've been shocked before? Okay. Now, if, when, when you haven't been shocked before by electricity, you are very courageous and bold with electricity. Because when, when you want to fix something that is electrical, you know, people who, who, who are very brave just go out there. They don't disconnect anything. They just unloose the wires and start playing with them until one day it shocks you to your heart. And from that day, the fear of electricity will begin wisdom in you. So next time you work in electricity, you go to the mains and you turn it off. And you go to the, uh, the distribution board and take the fuses out. And then you go to the object and you turn it off. Because the fear of electricity has taught you wisdom. Have you noticed that people who work in a field that is very dangerous take a lot of precautions that are sometimes excessive? And people who are not in that industry take things for granted. Why? Because one has wisdom and the other has no wisdom. Fear teaches wisdom. And that fear is not the fear that makes you run away, but the fear that makes you respect something. When we fear the Lord, we respect his laws, we respect his order. That is spiritual wisdom. Second dimension of wisdom is mental. That is what most of us are 
used to. Mental wisdom is to have deep insight and understanding on a subject. It having a deep insight on how things work. When the Bible talks about wisdom, in this sense, it's not even talking about high IQ. It is talking about practical application to solutions. Mental understanding of life. Second, third dimension of wisdom is moral. Moral wisdom is to know the right from the wrong. To be able to judge whether somebody's action is right or wrong. If a person has moral wisdom, they are able to make the right choices. People who don't have moral wisdom are faced with two opposites and sometimes have no idea which one to choose. That's moral. Fourth dimension of wisdom is that wisdom is practical. Practical wisdom that is the ability to provide solutions. Now, when you observe wisdom generally, there are two ways people look at wisdom. People look at wisdom as philosophy and people look at wisdom as practical solutions. Two different main ways. So when we say, for example, somebody is wise, sometimes we mean he has a lot of philosophical ideas or sometimes we mean he solves problems. Now, these two ways of seeing wisdom come from the Greek understanding of wisdom and the Hebrew understanding of wisdom. When a Hebrew tells you that he is wise, it doesn't necessarily mean that he has nice philosophy. It means that he is able to solve problems. When a Greek person tells you somebody is wise, it means the person has nice philosophy. That the word philosophy simply means love of wisdom. Love of wisdom. Sophos or Sophia. Wisdom and philos. So, when you look through the Bible, therefore, the Bible is written mainly, especially in the Old Testament, from a Hebrew point of view. So, the biblical wisdom is not information. Biblical wisdom is solution. There are a lot of people who have information with no solution. I know people who teach on managing finances who are totally broke. They have philosophy, but they have no solution. As Christians, we are not looking for philosophy. We are looking for solution. When the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing, it doesn't mean go and read all the books in the world. It simply means learn how to apply yourself to solve the problems you face around you. Wisdom is the principal thing. And in all you're getting, get the ability to solve problems. Not the ability to know everything from A to Z. And number five, wisdom is governmental. Wisdom is governmental. It is the ability to rule with fairness and equity. And I want to stay a little bit on governmental wisdom because most times people see it as political. But it's not primarily political. It can be political, but it's not primarily political. When we say wisdom is governmental, it helps you to manage your life well. When I was growing up as a young man, I was a very disorganized young man, as most young people are. Didn't have the value of organizing my life. But I had a friend. He was slightly older than me, and he had started work. And uh, he lived in an outhouse, uh, what is called seven quarters in some parts of the world. I don't think you have that here in America. May God help you. Uh, but, you know, most big mansions will have a small house at the back, and that's where the servants uh, uh, live. Boys' quarters, servants' quarters. So this guy lived in a boys' quarters, and he lived in a small room, I think maybe... 10, 10 by 10 foot, 10 foot by 10 foot. And uh, 
you know, he was very organized. Very organized. And any time I visited him, his bed was always laid. I couldn't imagine why a young man's bed should be laid. It, you know, never entered his room with his bed not laid. His bed is always laid. And his clothes, as few as they were, always ironed, always arranged. He had a small display uh, case in his room uh, in which he display, displayed uh, canned food items. So um, a tin of Milo, a tin of milk, a tin of corned beef, a couple of sardines, empty box, uh, a box of, uh, uh, of cornflakes, and so on and so forth. And, and he had them, and they're always in line. Always in line. Always. And, and his plates are always on, on that uh, thing, you know, always, everything, cutlery, everything in line. And I went to his home in the morning, afternoon, evening, never saw him disorganized. I said, how could he do it? He had a governmental sense. That is wisdom, the ability to govern your life. Everything about him was organized. He was a young man. And from him, I learned how to organize my life. Well, I later found out that all those tins of Milo and milk uh, were all empty. You know, but, but, you know, he was organized. He was organized. It was a good show. It was a good show. But he was organized. And, and everything was organized around him. And I understood, even though you are young, you can have an organized life. Wisdom is governmental. That means you can govern your life. You can go to a home. You have a parent, a couple of children, maybe three, four children. And when you go to the home, you look on the walls. And it's graffiti. <laughs> the children have written on the walls and, 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 and you know, there's a lot of mess on the wall. And he asked the parents, why, why are all these uh, artwork and, and writings on the wall? They say, well, the children. The children. Then you go to another home, two parents, four children. The walls are clean. There's children too. What is lacking is not children, it's governance. You're always going to have troublesome people, but people with governmental wisdom can bring order. Order in the, church, in the place. So, wisdom is spiritual, it's mental, it's moral, it's practical, and it is governmental. What is the effect of wisdom? I'm still in my introduction of the subject. What is the effect of wisdom? Wisdom is the map that moves you to your destination. Is the map. If you want to move from A to B, you're going to need wisdom to navigate your path. If you want to move from ordinariness to extraordinariness, you're going to need wisdom. That's your map. If you want to access greatness, you're going to need wisdom. You're going to need wisdom. It's the map. And as you move through life, you're going to need this map to guide you. Wisdom is the gap between your problems and your solution. Every problem in life has a solution. Every problem. You may know it or not know it, but there is always a solution. Wisdom is the gap between you and your problems. If you lack it, the distance between you and your solution will be far. If you have it, you will bridge the gap. Have you noticed that every problem you have has been solved by somebody? Have you noticed that? There's no problem you have which hasn't been solved. Everything you struggle with, somebody has overcome. 
So your problem is not unique, but your lack of wisdom is very unique to you. So, let's say marriage problems. Every marriage problem any one of us have has been solved by one couple or the other. Every marriage problem. You say, well, my husband is this way. My husband is, is, doesn't, he doesn't care. He doesn't show affection. My wife is like spending all the money. <laughs> Whatever the problem is, somebody has solved it. Somebody has had wisdom to solve it. You say, well, you know, I, I need money. I need to know how to make money. People have solved how to make money. I need to be healthy. I need to live healthy. People have solved that problem. Just talk about any problem you have. It has been solved by somebody. In other words, the problem is not unique. What is the differentiation between you and that person is wisdom. Every problem is a wisdom problem. A lack of of wisdom or availability of wisdom problem. Wisdom is the gap between you and your solution. I remember so well when I was in secondary school, I hated that subject that all of us hate, <laughs> mathematics. I don't know how people are able to solve those kinds of things. I, I like mathematics so far as it deals with numbers. But once you start bringing alphabets into it, my mind can't take it any longer because numbers are numbers, alphabets are alphabets. You know, when you say 2x times 3y equals time, it will equal something else. And I said, how can I know what x and y should produce? <laughs> I, I just, my mind couldn't get it. But there were people who could grasp those things just like that. They could get it. The gap between me and them was wisdom. <laughs> I remember somewhere in secondary school we were doing a math problem and you know normally in the textbooks they will give you examples of how the problem is solved, give you about three examples and it seems very simple when you're following it from the textbook, you know, do it this way, do it that way, do it. So I went through, do it this way. Then they asked the question. Then you realize, where did I thought there's the example and that's how it's supposed to work and it didn't work that way. So I tried solving the problem, try solving, try solving, try solving, try solving. It didn't work. So finally I mustered the courage and I went to my math teacher and said, I said, sir, the question is wrong. <laughs> he said, oh, the question can be wrong. I mean, it's in the textbook. I said, yeah, it's, in the, it's a printing mistake. This question is wrong because I've used your examples. I've done everything you said we should do and, and it's not working. There's something wrong with the question. So he said, okay, well, stand here. So he called one of those crazy people in everybody's class. You know, you wonder how come you are in the same class with this boy. They mess up your life. So he called one of these crazy boys and he says, okay, so, so come here and come and show. Uh, so he came to show his work. And he had worked it out and solved it. So my math teacher told me, and I will never forget. He said, Otabil, the problem is not a question. The problem is in your head. <laughs> what he's telling me is, the problem is not what you are faced with. The problem is the wisdom you have to solve what you are faced with. Don't blame the question. Blame your wisdom. Wisdom is the gap between you and your solution. Wisdom is the tap through which your energies flow. It's the map, it's the gap, it's the tap. Wisdom channels your gifts, 
your talent, your ability. Everything you have is going to be channeled through your wisdom or lack of it. If you have a reservoir of pure water, and when we say pure water from West Africa, it has a totally different meaning. <coughs> but however you clarify, a, a reservoir of pure water. And you have the pipe or the, 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 the receiver or it, come, it comes to your home. But between the reservoir and your home or wh wherever you are dispensing from, there is a pipeline that takes from the reservoir to the user. No matter how pure that pipe, the reservoir is with the water in it, if the pipeline is dirty, that pure water will be dirty. Wisdom is that pipeline. The Spirit of God can be in you. The Holy Spirit can be in you. The power of God can live inside you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But if the pipeline is full of fear. Pipeline is full of inferiority complex. Pipeline is full of self-doubt. Christ in you, the hope of glory, will be channeled through fear. And what comes out will not be what's in the reservoir, it's what's in the pipeline. <laughs> Wisdom is the pipeline that channels your talent. We don't have a problem of talent in this world. We don't have problem of gifts. You know, we've, we've done a lot of things teaching people to discover their gifts, their talents, their ability. What we haven't helped people with is to deal with their mindset that is using the talent and the ability and the gift. Because wisdom is that pipeline. And if it's polluted, it's going to pollute whatever gift God has for you. I have seen extremely talented people make a mess of their lives. And I've seen very, very average talent people do extraordinary things with their lives. Each one of us have sat in class with people who got all the A's in class and got all the F's in life. And we've sat in people who got the F's in class and the A's in life because of the pipeline. Pipeline. Wisdom is that pipeline. It will channel what God has given to you. Don't pray for more anointing. Pray for wisdom to use the anointing. Don't pray for more talent. Pray for wisdom to channel your talent right. Because wisdom is the principal thing. It is the connector between the reservoir and the user. Wisdom is the cup to your performance in life. You cannot act beyond your wisdom level. As your wisdom is, so is your life. Wisdom is a limit to your performance. It's the, like the cap to a bottle. If you cap a bottle, you can't add anything to it. And not only can you add nothing to it, you can pour anything out of it. Wisdom will determine how much can remain in you, how much can go out of you, how much can come inside you. Performance is a wisdom problem. I have seen people perform and promoted to a level of incompetence. They're doing so well at one level, you take them to the next level and they act so unwisely, I was going to say foolishly but this is church, so they act so unwisely and mess up everything people who are great performers but horrible team leaders because they don't have the wisdom to deal with a team they don't have the wisdom to encourage people to perform, it's all about their performance and nobody else, wisdom is going to be the tap it's going to be the cap it will cap how far you go 
in life. So, if wisdom is so important, how do we get it? Where do we find wisdom? Well, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, tells us where to find wisdom. Proverbs 8, 1 to 3 says, Does not wisdom cry out, and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on the top of the high hill, beside the way, where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. It's telling us where to locate wisdom. Very interesting. There are four places it tells us wisdom is located. If you want to find wisdom, you're going to find them in these four places. Number one, it says wisdom is at the top of the hill. She takes her stand on the top of the hill. That means that wisdom is exposed. Wisdom is visible. Wisdom is high and lifted up. It is exalted on top of the hill so that anybody approaching can see it. Wisdom is not in a valley. It's not in a cave. It's not in a secret place. Now you have to get the imagery of the person writing the book of Proverbs because he's talking from the standpoint of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is surrounded by hills. The highest Mount Zion on which is the temple. And he says when you're approaching Jerusalem wisdom is on top of the hill. So if you are from afar the first thing you're going to see is wisdom. It's on top of the hill. It's exposed. It's public. You don't need to go into a secret place to find wisdom. There are people who say that you need to be initiated into a secret society. You need to learn a secret language. You need a special code to access wisdom. No, according to the Bible, biblical wisdom is not in a cave. It is on top of the hill. It's exposed. It's visible for all to see. Second place you find wisdom is that it is beside the way. It is beside the way. That means it is commonplace. It is by the wayside. She takes a stand on top of the hill beside the way. Beside the way. That means that if you were going to Jerusalem... Find wisdom. First, wisdom is on the hill. But let's say you were not looking up. So you say, well, I wasn't looking up, so I didn't see wisdom. You know, everybody's supposed to lift up his head. I wasn't lifting up my head. You know, it's not my fault. I, my head was down. He says, well, if your head is down, wisdom is by the wayside. Wisdom is by the wayside. It's commonplace. It's by the wayside. Now remember the culture in which the Bible is written is not the American culture. It's more like a West African culture. Where you can buy everything from diapers to a coffin by the wayside. You can, you can, you can have lunch, uh, breakfast by the wayside, lunch by the wayside, dinner by the wayside, buy a newspaper by the wayside, buy diapers for your baby by the wayside, buy a coffin for your grandmother by the wayside. It's all right by the wayside. So. so he says wisdom is on top of the hill. But for those who said, well, I couldn't lift up my head. I was looking down. I was depressed. depressed. Wisdom is by the wayside. So let's say, well, I, I wasn't looking by the wayside. I was so focused on my life. I wasn't looking up. I wasn't looking by the wayside. It tells us the third place wisdom is where the paths meet. That means it's at a junction. So you're, 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 you're going up there. You didn't look up. You didn't look by the wayside. So you're just looking down. You hit the junction. Wisdom is there. You can't escape it. 
So for those who say, well, I can't find wisdom because I couldn't look up. I can't find wisdom because I wasn't looking by the side. I can't find wisdom. It's at a junction. But let's say you passed the junction and you didn't see wisdom. So where is wisdom finally? It says wisdom is by the gates. So you didn't see wisdom on top of the hill. You didn't see wisdom by the roadside. You didn't see wisdom at the junction of life. Then you go to your home right in front of your door. Wisdom. In all these locations the Bible says wisdom is in. It says wisdom is crying out and wisdom is lifting up her voice. So it's on the hill saying I'm here. By the roadside I'm here. At the junction I'm here. In front of your door I'm here. It takes extreme effort to be foolish. You have to work extra hard to be foolish. Because wisdom is more accessible than foolishness. So for a person to make a foolish mistake, they have to ignore the obvious. You have to ignore everything that is obvious. It's like somebody who is going to marry a man. The man is lying to you right now. <laughs> Every story he's told you is a lie. The car is not his. The house is not his. The job he says he has is not his. But he dresses well. And he says, I love you. And all the signs, wisdom is crying by the roadside. This is danger, 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 danger. But he said, oh, I love you. Oh, oh, the way he wants, he makes me feel. The way he makes me feel. I believe God will change him. Foolishness. It takes effort to be foolish. It takes a lot of effort. Because most of the things we need to make the right choices are so available and accessible. Wisdom is not too far from us. You don't need to initiate in a secret society. Go to some of our villages. People who have never been to school and listen to their wisdom observation of life. They learn wisdom from the antelope from the ant, from the snake, from the bird, from the tree, from the river. And when you give them a problem, they're going to start with a proverb based on observation. They're telling you wisdom is in the river, is in the stone, it's in the mountain, it's all around us. When Solomon was advising the lazy man, he didn't say, go and read more books. Go and read about Einstein. Go and get a degree. He says, go to the ant. You sluggard. Go to the ant. And you're going to learn wisdom. Because wisdom is not a mystery. It's so in your face. It's so in your face, you have to make an effort to ignore it. Because most of the time, the most obvious answer is the obvious answer. Most of the time in life. People can complicate it, but the answers are so simple right there. That is why sometimes the people who catch wisdom are children. Who ask the simple questions out of which we get answers. So wisdom is in these places. What does wisdom say? What is wisdom saying? Proverbs chapter 8 verse 9, 6 to 9. This is wisdom speaking. Listen. For I will speak of excellent things. From the opening of my mouth, my lips will come right 
things. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And all the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. So wisdom is standing in these high places and wisdom is speaking. What is wisdom saying? First thing, it says wisdom says excellent things. Wisdom says excellent things. Wisdom is always going to call you to what is high and above. Wisdom is always going to call you to excellent things. So, so let, let's, let's take it this way. You're seeking advice from your best friend. You say, well, you know, my wife... Our marriage is in trouble. My wife these days, you know, I, I don't really like the way she behaves when I get home. And I'm, I'm beginning to get irritated. So that's the problem. Now, you're talking to two friends. Wisdom. So what should I do? The first one says, leave her alone. She's a woman, after all. Leave her. Don't, don't mind her. Now, what the person has told you to do is don't do anything about it or do the easiest thing. The other person says, I think you should take time and sit with her and listen to her. One is calling you to do something higher. The other is calling you to do something lower. The way to find wisdom is the one who is talking about excellent things. The advice that calls you to do more than what is normal to you. Wisdom is always the voice of excellence. It's always the voice of excellence. Wisdom will never tell you, leave it as it is. Wisdom will tell you to go the extra mile. Wisdom will tell you to work a little harder. Wisdom will tell you to give off your best. Because wisdom speaks of excellent things. Wisdom speaks of things that are right. Wisdom is not going to tell you to do something that is not right. It will not call us to disorder and chaos. Wisdom will tell us to manage our lives better. It will tell us to do what is right. The voice that tells you what is right, that's the voice of wisdom. Wisdom is a voice that tells you to do what is true. It calls you to what is trustworthy, what is firm. Wisdom is not deceptive, is not crookish, and is not shallow. Wisdom calls us to righteousness. So how do you determine whether what somebody is saying is wise or not? Is it excellent? Is it right? Is it truthful? Is it calling us to righteousness? If it is, that's the voice of wisdom. If it's calling you to break the rules, tell a lie, bend something, one law or the other, that's not wisdom speaking. It may seem intriguing to you, but that path is not the path of wisdom. Wisdom will call you to things that are excellent, that are right, that are truthful, that are righteous. So if you want to measure on a scale whether the advice you receive is wise or not, judge it by that. Is it excellent? Is it right? Is it truthful? Is it righteous? That's how you judge. The book of Proverbs is full of contrasts. And the chief contrast you find in the book of Proverbs is between two kinds of people. The wise and the fool. And so when you read the book of Proverbs, you find the wise man or the prudent man or the diligent man and then the foolish man. You know, I, I don't like saying foolish in church because it feels like I'm insulting people. But it's in the Bible. So just take it, I'm quoting the Bible. 
unfortunately, not everybody is wise. You find the fool, the forward, the simple, it describes two kinds of people. So I'm going to run you through uh, that, a little bit of that, and then we would wait for tomorrow when I really talk about practically how wisdom works. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 15 to 16. The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool rages and is self-confident. The wise man is called prudent and diligent. And the Bible says he examines a path before following. He investigates before starting the journey. He considers the outcome before he starts. That is why successful companies and nations invest a lot in research. There is a direct link between the quality of a company's research and its output. Because the wise man considers well his path before he starts. The foolish man is the one who is raging bold without any consideration of consequences. Don't ever equate bravado for wisdom. Just be because you are bold doesn't mean you are wise. I've seen a lot of bold and foolish people in my lifetime. They rush into trouble without considering the consequences. The foolish man, the Bible says, is also called the simple man and the lazy man. The word simple means childish, naive, inexperienced. The foolish man is easily persuaded by what he hears. So when he hears something, he just believes it. The foolish man looks at you with your teeth showing and he can't tell whether you are laughing, grinning, or mocking him. The foolish man looks at everybody who has his teeth out and say, that's my friend. Appearances deceive them. They get easily hurt and destroyed. If you fall into the same trap over and over and over and over and over, may I suggest to you, you are not wise. If people deceive you over and over, if your story is, you know, I trust people, they let me down. I trust people, they let me down. I trust people, they let me down. You are not wise. You're not wise. It simply means you're not learning from human nature. People stab you in the back all the time. There are people who always say, my best friend, my best friend stabbed me. Once is okay. After that, you can stab me because I'm going to read you 10 miles away. It is said that a good chess player anticipate about 14 moves with every move he makes. So when he makes a move, he anticipates every move you can make and then he anticipates what he can do next and what you would do and what he would do and what he would do 14 levels. The foolish man just makes a move and prays. Oh, I believe it will be well. There are a lot of foolish Christians, my friends. Foolish born again Christians. Who are believers and not thinkers. You lie to them, they believe it. You deceive them. They... You know the Christians, born again Christians, are the easiest people to deceive? Yeah, Pastor Gandhi says they like to be deceived. As a matter of fact, when I started ministry as a young man, I was talking to an older, I wouldn't call him man of God, but an older practitioner. (laughs) 
You know, the way, you know, people who are ahead always want to advise young people. So this older guy, uh, he had supposedly been in ministry for a long time. And he called me, he says, young man, I like you. You know, I like the way you teach. But he says, one thing about people, they like to be deceived. And he says, you have to deceive them. Oh, yeah, he told me that. He said, you have to deceive them because if you don't deceive them, they will go to somebody else to deceive them. So deceive them yourself. That's what the older practitioner told me. Because he had learned the trade. And he had realized human beings generally don't think. And especially when they get born again, their spirits start working, their brains freeze. There is no intelligence afterwards. So they start running. You know, some of you are sitting here in this nice church. You still run after a prophet and go and give all your money to him. And the next day he comes, you do the same. And the next day you do the same. Some God is deceiving you, but you are willingly participating. Because the foolish man does not consider consequence. He doesn't sit back to analyze and say, I took that step last year. What are the results this year? Doesn't consider his ways. He's simple. He walks into traps very easily. The fool is easily persuaded by what he hears. Even when you tell him one side of the story, he doesn't wait to hear the other side of the story. One of the things you learn as a pastor very soon is that there are always more than one side to the story. When you start pastoring as a young pastor, doing marriage counseling, you listen to the wife first, you feel like this is the most horrible husband. Until you listen to the husband, then you say that's the most horrible woman. So then your mind is going between horrible and horrible. It's not horrible and horrible. They are talking about two sides of reality. And your job is to help them to reconcile the two opposites of what they see. And if you can do that, they can resolve their issues. The fool just believes everything that they hear. Including what they hear on radio and television in the media. If there is anything I've learned in life, never trust the media. Especially in this, your great country, never trust the media. The media in your country and all over the world have discovered their power over people. And they believe they can make you go wherever they want you to go. I have learned with my life, shut the media out, go to source material, make your own conclusions. And trust your conclusions. Because your conclusions may not be popular to what everybody is saying. You have to have your own mechanism for making decisions and, and choices. If you just go by, he says, she says, he says, he says, oh, you'll be deceived. But wisdom is for the one who orders his way right. And let me close with it. I have one minute remaining. Just give me three more minutes and I will be through. I'll conclude with this verse. Most of you know it. Psalm 14 verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There are no, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I, you know, it's one of those verses where you read it and you think, I know what it is saying. I used to think the Bible, the passage says, the fool says there is no God. But that's not what the verse, the, the verse doesn't say the fool says there is no God. But the fool has said in his heart, 
there is no God. There is a difference between saying something in your heart and saying it. All right. So what does it mean when it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God? The fool knows there is a God, but convinces himself that there is no God. So what the passage is saying is the fool is the person who denies self-evident truth. The fool is the person who denies self-evident truth. Give you an example. Somebody goes to stand on top of uh, the tallest building here in D.C. Okay, you don't have a tall building, but Washington Monument. Somehow finds a way to climb on top of the Washington Monument. And he stands there and says, I don't believe in gravity. I won't die. I won't die. And jumps. He's a fool. Because everything he knows in life tells him, if it's up, it's coming down. But he feels that if he can say it enough, it will negate the reality. The fool is a person who knows the truth, but convinces himself that the truth is not true. Is the one who feels, I'm going to build, I'm going to be great. And I'm going to do is taking the lottery. Every statistic tells him he's not going to win. But he says in his heart, I believe God will make a way where there seems to be no way. The fool has said in his heart, what he knows to be true is not true. The fool here is not somebody who genuinely does not believe there is a God. But the person who knows there is God, but convinces himself that what he knows to be true is not true. It's called self-denial. Self-denial. And there are a lot of believers in that state of foolishness. They know there is God, but every step they take tells you they don't believe that God would do what he said he would do. You know, there are believers who believe they can lie and somehow God will still bless it. They can cheat and somehow God will still bless it. They can be deceptive and somehow God will still bless it. If they speak enough tongues, it will sanctify the lie. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Is a person who lives in self-denial and doesn't face the truth that he knows he faces. Wisdom is acknowledging self-evident truth. Wisdom does not tell you that there is no gravity. But wisdom tells you if you're on top of the Washington Monument and you want to get down, either got a ladder crawl your way down, parachute your way down. But jumping and hoping you'll be saved doesn't work. That's what Satan wanted Jesus to commit. He says, if you are the son of God, jump. And there are people who are jumping to prove God. God is not committed to your unbelief. He's not committed to your self-doubt. He's committed only to faith. And if you believe God will protect you, you'll protect yourself. If, if you're really driving on, on, you know, and you, you believe that God wants you to be safe on the road, and you believe in safety, you put on seatbelt. But a person says, I believe God will protect me, but I won't put on my seatbelt. is a fool. Because the f- The wise man is the one who believes a fact and acts in a way that confirms he believes in a fact. Because faith is not just a belief. Faith is an act. It's something you do in in agreement with what you believe. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about practically how wisdom helps in solving the problem 
problems of this world. And I'm going to talk about Solomon on the, on the third, on Tuesday, and, and Solomon's wisdom. And we're going to do an analysis of Solomon's wisdom and see how it functions in our world. I trust that God will make you wise in all your choices and in all your decisions. You will not be deceived. You will not be a victim of circumstances. You will not walk into traps that have been set for you. When people smile, you will know whether it's a grin or a smile. When people stand in front of you and say, you are my best friend, you will know whether they hold a knife behind them or they're really genuine. You will not fall into traps that have been set for you. The wise man orders his way right. And I pray that the Lord will order your way right and make you great. But I don't, can't stop this morning without giving people the chance to enter wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is useless to you if you haven't entered the door. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're here this morning, you say, yeah, I like to be wise. I want to be wise. We're not talking about reading books. We're not talking about just being a nice person. We're talking about approaching wisdom through the door of God. And if you are here and Jesus Christ is not in your heart, he's not the Lord, your Lord and Savior, you've not given your life to him, everything I've said about wisdom will pass you by. You can never receive this wisdom we are talking about because it starts with the fear of the Lord. And we're going to pray very shortly. And if you are here and you say, I want to enter the gate. I want to enter the door. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to be born again. I want my sins to be forgiven. I want to start a life with God that is right. I'm going to give you the chance to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Kindly, let's be in a moment of prayer as we consider everything we've heard this morning. As we are in this moment of prayer, consider your life. Consider where you are going in eternity. Consider God's love for you. Consider what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross of Calvary. And if you are here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want Jesus in my heart. I want to be born again. I want my sins forgiven. I want to enter the door of wisdom this morning. If that's your prayer, just lift up your right hand. If that's your desire, lift up your right hand wherever you are. In this auditorium at the floor, in the overflow, in the balconies, wherever you are. Lift up your right hand. Don't be shy. Don't be intimidated. Let your right hand go up. God bless you. I see some hands up. If your hand is up, I'm going to ask you wherever you are to come to the front as we pray with you to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. If your hand is up, just come to the front. Just rise up and come to the front. We're not here to embarrass you. We're here to help you to enter the door. To enter the door. If your hand is up, just rise up and come to the front. Is anybody coming? Everybody lift up your hand to God. And say with me, Lord Jesus, I come to you. You are the door. You are the way. Today, I acknowledge that you are the son of God. That you died for me. That you rose again from the dead to give me salvation. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I declare you as my Lord as my baptizer, as my healer. Today, I confess boldly, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I am a child of God. I thank you, Father, for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you. God bless you. Pastor.